Welcome everyone to this patient focused webinar. My name is Katie Davis with Insight Tech, and I'm pleased to be part of today's virtual education event. Please be patient as we take a few minutes to allow everyone to get signed on. The presentation will begin shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the patient education webinar. Uh, we titled this from uh, Dependent to Independent. It's a series of four webinars that we will be holding. Me and my partner, uh, Dr. Danny Roque, uh, wanted to connect with the patients and share some of the thoughts about uh, treatment options for patients with tremors. Uh, both of us are at UNC School of Medicine. I'm an associate professor of neurosurgery. And I want to uh, start off by uh, thanking uh, you, all the participants and, and patients, uh, for uh, joining uh, us today in this webinar and sharing your stories and, and being a part of this dialogue. We, we certainly see this as an opportunity for us to interact, for us to uh, get to know you, uh, and, and for us to really understand your challenges, uh, because those are the ones that, that inspire us to create solutions that can work for you, uh, can allow you to improve your symptoms and go back to doing things that you enjoy doing in your life. Uh, your trust in our care motivates us. Uh, for a lot of us, you know, that's the main driver uh, for us to uh, to engage in you know, research uh, advances and to provide excellent clinical care uh, to really improve the lives of our patients. So your trust matters a lot uh, for us. And then when you feel better, this brings us joy and satisfaction. And uh, you know, we we really uh, you know are excited about. You know, your journey that starts after uh, you have improvement in your symptoms, you feel better, and are able to uh, spend time and do things with your loved ones that you enjoy. So I'll start off by a brief uh, summary of what we have today, and my partner, Dr. Roque, will go into greater details about, uh, about these uh, uh, items. So in general, the way we look at uh, the surgical options for patients with movement disorders, we have two main buckets. One bucket is the stimulation bucket, and the other bucket is the ablation. And a lot of you have heard about uh, this treatment uh, called deep brain stimulation, which is being done uh, with two different techniques, awake technique uh, and a sleep technique. Uh, at UNC, uh, we have tremendous uh, experience and expertise in both of these techniques of doing deep brain stimulation. And then we have a bucket of treatment we call ablation, that allows us to uh, have a tremendous improvement in patients' quality of life. And the key uh, advancement in this ablation bucket is focused ultrasound ablation that has allowed us to help patients uh, with movement disorders. And then gamma knife ablation, which has been uh, there for some time as well. <clears throat> I want to share with you some of the exciting advances in our field uh, that we have witnessed. Uh, and so uh, you've heard about robotics a lot. And in our field, too, robotics has made a tremendous impact. And UNC uh, <clears throat> Health System recently invested in acquiring this robotic system. We call this ROSA robot that allows us to very precisely deliver uh, you know, therapeutics. In our case, say, for example, deep brain stimulation electrodes. In some other cases, uh, epilepsy monitoring electrodes and such uh, allow us to really uh, do a very precise surgery in locations that we intend to do surgery. Then uh, a lot of you probably heard about uh, this uh, move towards personalized medicine, where we are, uh, you know, devising these uh, these uh, treatments and really tailoring these to patient-specific anatomy to patient-specific needs. So in our field, the the main advance towards personalized medicine has been through a technique called tractography that allows us to map these patients' brain connections in details that we have never been able to do before, and really identifying areas of the brain that need to be targeted, therapeutic areas we call these, or also mapping out areas that could give patients side effects, and so really tailoring our treatments away from brain areas that could be causing side effects. And we had uh, tremendous uh, experience in this uh, type of personalized medicine, and we have published in this area showing uh, very precise uh, treatments that led to significant improvement in patient symptoms. In our case, uh, we tested this in focused ultrasound ablation and showed 
more than 50% improvement in hand tremor at three months and very uh, optimized treatment that reduced the risk of side effects. So again, a very exciting advance that we uh, have worked on and, and published. Another advancement in our field has happened in the field of electrical stimulation, where uh, earlier uh, the electrical stimulation was what we used to call omnidirectional, where the electrical field would uh, would uh, spread around in a uniform way around the uh, brain electrodes. In recent times, uh, tech technology advancements have led us uh, to have directional uh, electrodes, which allow us to steer current preferentially in areas that improve patient symptoms while moving away from areas that could cause side effects. So you could see how the electrical field in these two uh, cartoons differ, where one is shifted off to one side, allowing us to do directional stimulation. And the latest advance in our field with focused ultrasound that has brought in tremendous excitement and enthusiasm in the field. Uh, so focused ultrasound, as the, as the name suggests is a uh, ultrasound-based treatment modality. As you can see, it uh, really uh, is enabled by what we call a ultrasound transducer, which looks like a helmet that sits on a patient's head. And it has thousand little ultrasound beam elements, we call these, that are arranged uh, in a hemispherical transducer that allows us to focus all these little beams precisely into a single spot. And if you were to think about it, these beams by themselves are harmless to the brain, but when thousands of these combine at a single spot, this allows us to raise the temperature in a controlled fashion and achieve ablation in brain areas that could improve tremors, slowness, stiffness, and dyskinesia and Parkinson's disease. The main uh, advantage of this modality is that it's paired with MRI that allows us to do brain imaging and mapping for temperatures uh, and to be able to uh, precisely deliver the simulation in the therapeutic areas. Uh, there's a few aspects of uh, focused ultrasound that Dr. Roque will be going over. I wanted to summarize this in the summary slides. It's an incisionless treatment that has immediate effects. We do this as an outpatient treatment. Doesn't require any implanted hardware or battery replacement and, and doesn't require uh, programming uh, at a later point. Uh, this is FDA approved and insurance reimbursed for essential tremor and tremor dominant Parkinson's disease and FDA approved for Parkinson's disease while we await for uh, the insurance reimbursement. And clinical trials are currently underway at UNC and elsewhere to look at its safety and effectiveness for the treatment of epilepsy as well. Now, I want to give you a, some idea of the workflow because these uh, treatments require several different uh, you know, team members and, and sort of parts of the puzzle to come together to get you ready for the surgery. And so I just want to give you a sense of how, what it looks like for a patient who's interested in getting, say, deep brain stimulation. Uh, patients uh, first have the referral sent to us at UNC, uh, which results triggers an appointment for you to see uh, Dr. Roque and our other partners in the uh, Movement Disorder Center, which, by the way, is a uh, Center for Excellence in, in Parkinson's Disease uh, here at UNC Chapel Hill. And then uh, we look at screening studies like MRI, neuropsychology testing based, based on patient symptoms and their needs, uh, followed by an appointment with neurosurgery in the clinic. Uh, and then uh, we start a plan about a surgical date, so you're contacted by a surgery scheduler. Uh, and patients who need any preoperative assessments like anesthesia and such are, are then uh, scheduled. This is shortly followed by a planning MRI and what we call a fiducial placement. Uh, that's a, uh, a clinic-based procedure that we do in preparation for deep brain stimulation surgery. Once all of these are accomplished, uh, then we uh, schedule patient surgery. Most of the surgeries are, are done in a single day. Uh, we call this stage, stage one surgery, but in some patients, if, the, if there is a specific need, then this could be uh, done in two separate days. This is followed by a, another uh, surgery that we call uh, a stage two operation, and there is uh, post imaging involved in between. And once all of this is uh, done, then you have programming follow-ups, and the whole process takes about uh, three to four months. So uh, it's, it's a process through which we take uh, the patients and make sure that it's safe uh, and, and efficacious to do this surgery. 
Similarly, for focused ultrasound, the workflow is very similar. It starts with a referral, followed by an appointment with dental surgery or movement disorders neurology. We have a team. And so depending on the availability, we see the patients, either myself or Dr. Roque, followed by any screening studies, uh, and then another appointment uh, for, for you to see either me or Dr. Roque, uh, followed by scheduling for surgery, any preoperative assessments, and then we go uh, for a planning MRI. And BRIC is the uh, center where we do these uh, imaging uh, studies and the treatment for focused ultrasound. And finally, the surgery is scheduled for focused ultrasound, then you have post-operative uh, imaging and then follow-up appointments. And the process uh, varies uh, from one to two to three months uh, overall, depending on uh, the patient's specific clinical needs. So this is an overview of the, of the process so that uh, we, we sort of have uh, expectations to go into the uh, process of getting the surgery done. Uh, who can consider surgery? Uh, patients who have been diagnosed with essential tremor have tried medications. And the two first-line medications are primidone and propanolol. So that's an important uh, step for us. Patients who have disabling symptoms, who are medically optimized from the standpoint of their heart health, the lungs, uh, and such, their physical health is optimized, and then their mental health is optimized. So these are the overall the basic uh, considerations for us. And Dr. Roque will go into the details uh, for these as well. And so that's where I'll uh, stop my, uh, my presentation. And, uh, hand it over to my partner, Dr. Roque. Perfect. And why we wait for Dr. Roque, um, thank you so much, Dr. Krishna. That was amazing and love that insight into the workflow and what patients can expect. And so for those of you on, if you've noticed at the bottom of your screen, there is a button called Q&A. So that is where you can put your questions in as they arise. Don't worry about waiting until the end. Um, and we will have time after the presentations to address all of those in the chat. So feel free to type away as we are going through the presentation and as you're triggered with questions and we will have time at the end to um, answer them and you can hear directly your answers. So with that, Dr. Roque, are you ready to start sharing your presentation? I am and hoping that that is already actively the case, yes? Yes, yes, it looks great. You sound great, let's go. Fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Daniel Roque. I'm a movement disorder specialist at the University of North Carolina. Uh, I've been here for uh, 12 years and, um, you know, build a practice specific to tremor management um, and sort of the sort of quality initiatives surrounding uh, tremor patients uh, of multiple different varieties, because uh, it is a very common syndrome for any reason, really, essential tremor being the most common reason. But we'll get into part of that today. My hope is to, as you see in the title, is to really review um, the diagnosis itself to make sure that folks here feel like it resonates with you, um, that the diagnosis, as you may or may not know, has actually changed over the course of the last five years. And it's important thing to keep in mind since those features are a little bit different, make sure it still resonates with you. And then generally how um, we recommend that you approach your uh, healthcare providers, your physicians, your nurse practitioners, your neurologists, if they're part of your care. Um, so uh, this is just a quick disclosure. I, I do provide a bit of education for other, for other groups. Um, so here are my goals for today's quick talk. Um, <clears throat> review again, review the information regarding essential tremor, understand its impact, which again, hopefully will resonate with you all. Um, attempt to separate essential tremor from other tremor syndromes when there's always that question that comes up before you ever get an evaluation or even thereafter as you get treatment and feel like medications or treatment options are failing, uh, making sure that we can appropriately separate them. Um, what to tell your healthcare provider who you already have established with, a neurologist or not, uh, with regards to the diagnosis, clarifying what to do next, um, especially as uh, treatment options may or may not be help, uh, helping you sufficiently. Understand the focus ultrasound, the procedure inherently, the role of the treatment in your overall care, um, the benefits on tremor, the risks and side effects that focus ultrasound brings to the table, um, and then how do you approach your neurologist more specifically, hoping you've already established with one, regarding finding out if you're a good candidate for the procedure. And then at the end of this, I hope to wrap up just so you can meet our team and hear a little bit more about what the program has to offer. So with those goals in mind, quite a bit, 
Uh, let's talk about the diagnosis. So what is essential tremor? Uh, certainly a condition where there is shaking of the arms, and that's sort of supposed to be the main focus here now, largely interrupting your ability to perform any number of tasks, um, requiring the use of your hands, your fingers, entire arms, um, that the tremor otherwise should not be better explained by other conditions or other causes. Because um, at the end of the day, there is not an available test that we can perform to formally diagnose you with essential tremor. It's a very clinical diagnosis. Like we like to say, you meet criteria for it. Um, it can absolutely involve shaking of other parts of the body, but the, the newest criteria tells us we need to have involvement of the arms in order to uh, meet this diagnosis. How common is it? Well, um, NIH tells us uh, that essential tremor can affect easily over 10 million people in the United States alone. For comparison, folks with Parkinson's roughly estimate about a million people in the United States at any given time with Parkinson's disease, of which about 70% of those folks will have some form of tremor, not everyone will. So uh, a very essential tremor, very, very common syndrome, and certainly the most common movement disorder, as we like to say. Um, what is the impact of tremor? Um, the things that you often hear, maybe you've already talked to your healthcare provider about this, is how it impacts your ability to eat, your ability to drink, your ability to uh, perform your handwriting. And maybe it does come up about how it could be embarrassing socially, otherwise, um, and, and those features do come up, but not as frequently. We get quite a few other aspects of intrusion on your daily activities. So just using your telephone, especially smartphones nowadays, can be a real impairment using a computer, whether it's your keyboard and overclicking on your keys or using your mouse and having your mouse uh, shake in places that you just can't get accuracy that you were looking for. Um, cooking, housekeeping, uh, certainly on transportation, some folks feel they can't get a good handle on the steering wheel and hobbies, right? And all these fine motor tasks that, um, you know, pre-tremor or certainly are folks who don't have to experience it, um, you know, don't realize what you might lose through that loss of fine motor tasks on your hobbies that often require them. So with those aspects in mind, how can we tell tremors apart from each other? So this is, um, this is a, about a 30 year uh, history of trying to get this honed in correctly. Um, there have been so many efforts over those three decades trying to get a sense of how to separate tremor syndrome since again, we don't have tests that get us a better answer. Um, and there are multiple other causes, and I'm not even being exhaustive here, um, and they respond differently to different treatments. So the goal is get the tremor diagnosis correct. Otherwise, you might go down the wrong pathway for tremor treatment uh, regimens. Um, here are just three examples. Like I mentioned, breast tremor, which comes up a lot as a possible symptom, not a diagnostic symptom of Parkinson's. Um, dystonia over contraction of certain muscle groups that can happen in a rhythmic way. So it looks like shaking um, and then tremor caused by medication. And this one, you don't have to go much further than if any family members, folks who don't have tremor syndromes, uh, once you, you know, start taking in too much caffeine, you might experience this yourself um, otherwise. And then again, I was already alluding to this. There are new criteria that we're using for the diagnosis of essential tremor in an effort to differentiate this condition from others. And it does require a bit of a keen eye from your healthcare providers to differentiate these successfully. So let's start with the most important aspect, which is that you need to have tremor of both arms with action. And we'll get to what we mean by action in a moment. Um, it could include tremor of other locations, but that is not required. And it certainly should not only include tremor of the head, of the legs, of the trunk. The arms need to be involved for this to be uh, considered uh, essential tremor. There is this new important criteria of at least having arm tremor for three years. And the reason for that is that in those three years, we see a lot of evolution of tremor into other syndromes um, that helps us differentiate that tremor and that tremor syndrome from essential tremor. Um, we know there's a bit of a long haul here is if you have essential tremor and that's the right diagnosis, this is going to be a progressive, continuous uh, condition. And I said, I was gonna to try to explain action tremor. There's a couple of different tremors that we talk about when we say action tremor. Um, this has to do with a posture that you might hold or an, or an intention tremor, which is a separate kind of tremor. The posture kind of speaks for itself. If you hold a posture, you should have tremor upon immediately creating that posture. So a few examples I pose here, holding onto a book, the moment you hold that book, um, the moment you're holding onto that plate uh, or a cup, 
uh, holding that fixed position and feeling that it is there from the very moment you held that position in place. Intention tremor, on the other hand, is you're actively moving your arm, your fingers, your, your wrist in order to reach a target, to, to perform something. This is where handwriting gets involved because you're actively you know, moving your fingers, moving your wrist, moving your arm to do so, reaching at the, uh, in the cupboard for an item, threading a needle. These are, are much more active. There's much less fixed posturing in that scenario. Um, and not every central tremor patient experiences these two kinds of tremor the same way. So this is an important feature of understanding how we're going to treat your tremor, your particular kind of tremor, uh, focusing on what bothers you most, what activities are most intrusive, uh, that the tremor is most intrusive upon, excuse me. And then there's other tremors and a separate, um, you know, table to show you here of different tremor types that we see we really don't really see very much, although we certainly can in a central tremor, the rest tremor. So truly when you are doing nothing or slightly separately, we call this in a re-emergent tremor where the rest tremor pushes through your posture. And this might resonate with some folks on the call. If you hold a posture for a long period of time and a long period is seconds to be clear, not minutes to hours, but for several seconds without tremor and then the tremor develops and grows, this is what we call a re-emergent tremor. It's different, it's more in line with the rest tremor features, um, but it does require you maintain that posture because a rest tremor, if you are moving, if you're intending to do something, really doesn't tend to manifest itself during those moments. And then a dystonic tremor, um, when, you're, when you're performing very specific activities where the tremor is intrusive and not in other activities that are also intention tremors, um, this is where dystonic tremor might be a feature. It becomes a little more obvious or evident if you are have a bit of a posture all the time in that arm, leg, neck, wherever you're having the tremor. If there's a fixed posture there, it makes it a little easy to diagnose, but that's not always the case. And so I go back to the fact that you need a keen eye to separate these tremor types. Um, I've mentioned a few examples of, of folks who have described their dystonic tremor to us, such as only when you're painting on an easel because of the specific posture you have to maintain, you know, extending your wrist back and trying to approach uh, the, uh, the easel or approach the, the canvas rather uh, in the midst of painting strictly only with handwriting, but no tremor elsewhere. So these are features that might suggest there's a dystonic tremor instead of essential tremor. Um, and the problem here, of course, also is that folks are allowed to have multiple types of tremors in the same, you know, in the, in, in the same individual. So um, you're not going to strictly be separating these. You're just trying to separate them in your mind as a provider because you know the treatment is different for each kind of tremor. So how do you get, you know, how do we approach rather uh, getting, getting your tremor treated or your tremor effectively uh, properly diagnosed? So how you know, we'll use your approach to your healthcare provider to help us get there. So the first thing they're going to need, um, and, and they may not have enough time for to do it on their own without your help, is to collect information about your tremor. Let's be a bit more specific. Start by asking others around you if they've noticed specific things about your tremor, specific descriptors, you know, get their words, right? Maybe when did, when did they appreciate tremor for the first time for you? It's not always the case that you're the first person who noticed your tremor. And that can be very useful information for you and for your healthcare provider to put a timeline to everything. Um, uh, well, I've alluded to the, to the length of time, but also, again, features of it, like when do others around you seem to appreciate your tremor is worse or what activities or uh, how much stress are you under, et cetera. Um, and then this will be important for treatment recommendations is how long has the tremor been disruptive to you? Because folks who have a strong family history of tremor might know that they had tremor when they were 15 years old, 18 years old, but it wasn't really bothering you back then. You could get through your daily activities, but rather now compare that to how long have you had a disruption uh, in specific activities due to your tremor? All this very helpful information. And then being more specific at that point. I alluded to this as well, but does, is there a family history of tremor? And, and I can tell you plenty of examples where I've had family members in the room who will tell me that, no, I don't have anyone in the, in the family who has tremor. And then someone in the room says, well, actually, when they lift up their arms, they appreciate it. So asking, right? Asking, because it may not come up. Uh, don't assume that it's not there. Um, and then here's, uh, you know, you, you might be invariably offered medication to try uh, if, the, if the tremor certainly bothers them enough. So can medications help? Um, 
They certainly can, but you see the rates here uh, of some meaningful success in reduction of tremor for the different types of medications out there uh, as best studied are not great. And these are really early results. If you follow folks over time, invariably there is some failure of these medications to have a longstanding effect uh, for folks. So you can see that maybe at best when you combine primidone and propranolol, so this is a traditional seizure medication, a traditional blood pressure medication, both of these together might help about two thirds, maybe three quarters of folks um, at first to, for a meaningful reduction of tremor. To be extremely clear here, we don't have cures for tremor even when we talk about surgery. We're just, we're trying to make things better, uh, not eliminate tremor. Um, Topamax or topiramate, some folks may be familiar with this on the call. This is another anti-seizure medication traditionally, but it was found to be useful particularly for intention tremor when you're trying to reach for items. Um, but less so for postural tremor. Even then, even though we can score them as better as providers, um, not everyone out there in the community feels like there's much of a change when you're on the medication. That's a pretty common experience. Um, and then some folks may have tried these in the past, clonazepam, gabapentin, there's a host of other medications attempted. None of these are really clearly useful, but I, I do know uh, healthcare providers out there are familiar with trying them anyways, because... Uh, you know, really, these are not new medications. They've been around for decades um, in all cases. So then again, approaching your healthcare provider, what are goals for your visit? So is the goal to clarify your diagnosis, right? You, you don't know if you have a central tremor. Uh, maybe there's no family history. You're seeing this for the first time in yourself. What do I do? Um, if you don't have a neurologist, at least seeing a neurologist to try to clarify the diagnosis. But even if you have a neurologist and you feel like something's not right about the label, um, seeing a movement disorder specialist. Um, this is a bit, as my mentor used to tell me, a bit like boutique neurology. We're trying to get in there and really make some uh, headway in terms of better understanding where your tremor is coming from. Um, is your goal instead to seek treatment? So requesting assistance with occupational therapy, there might be specific activities you just want some help with. You don't want to start meds. That's very reasonable. Um, or maybe it's about starting medications. Um, so that's a good first start. So what if therapy, occupational therapy, medications didn't help as we're starting to see that there, there's at least some reasonable failure rate? Well, then that's where surgical techniques start to come into play. There's a few that are technically FDA approved, and there's a bit of history here too. Traditional thalamotomies, a thalamotomy being burning this hole in the brain in the structure of interest, um, this requires historically opening up uh, the skull, uh, providing a heating device of sorts. So a, we used to we basically call it a physical hot rod to get into the brain um, and burn the tip of that rod in order to make a hole in the brain. Um, this is where things started and it goes back to the 1940s, actually, when we start talking about the history of where this all began. Eventually, when you skip forward multiple decades, there's an opportunity to use in the exact same spot that we used to do thalamotomies deep brain stimulation surgery. We are talking about placing wires inside of the brain, um, aiming for that same location, uh, that those wires are connected to a pacemaker. And that pacemaker sends electrical stimulation to those parts of the brain in an effort to suppress tremor. So it turns out if you burn a hole in the brain, you can suppress tremor. If you stimulate that same part of the brain, you can suppress tremor. Um, this does require living with hardware though. All this has to be connected to that pacemaker. But then move forward, we now go back to burning a hole. But when you burn a hole, you never have to open the skull, which is where focus ultrasound comes in. Um, and you use the techniques that already Dr. Krishna alluded to, sending those ultrasound beams to that focal area in order to burn that same location and uh, with the goal of effectively reducing tremor as best as we can. So, um, all of that, like, why do we have all these options? We have them because of the timeline that was available to us. I already alluded to how in the 1940s, we started with the original thalamotomies. When you move forward into 1999 through 2006, we start getting approval for deep brain stimulation surgery. Um, this largely replaces the traditional thalamotomies, but now we move into the approval in 2016 and beyond where focus ultrasound has a bit of return to form, but in a much, much safer way. And in, in, quite frankly, with results that are that, that at, at a minimum are comparables, which is why we're really trying to uh, show folks there are options, right? There are options available to you to suppress tremor. And now we don't even have to open the skull to do it. 
So let's transition that into the discussion about how, uh, the focus ultrasound ablation. Multiple names, you're going to see this everywhere and in multiple locations, lots of acronyms. Um, if it confuses you, it confuses us. But the reality is that we're just trying to, we're trying to speak the same language. You'll see that there's, again, multiple ways to describe this. But at the end of the day, what are we aiming to do? We're trying to still burn that hole. We're trying to burn this very, very precise hole using the ultrasound beams uh, from, uh, from that uh, transducer. Um, and it's all in an effort to reduce the tremor again. It's uh, again, not trying to cure it, just trying to reduce the tremor. When you hone in all those beams, it heats the spot of interest. Um, and uh, eventually you can create, you can burn that hole, but start by heating. It does require the use of an MRI scanner because that helps us see the progression of what we're doing. So you, you, know, you are gonna be in a scanner and coming in and out of a scanner throughout the procedure. Um, just to clarify some things that sometimes don't make their way into discussions is that you are awake and you are awake for the entire procedure. Your head is shaven for this as well. That's what allows us to do this reliably. Um, it's necessary to test the tremor and to test side effects several times uh, or four potential side effects several times as we are heating. The goal of this is to have the best outcomes possible once you're done with your procedure. Um, there is this head frame that is fixed, and I'll show you a picture of that here, um, where you basically have these four spots that are numbed out with anesthetic, um, and then they are placed and basically uh, to bolt onto your head so that your head does not move during the procedure. We are putting all of this fixed on the bed of the MRI scanner to move you in and out of the scanner reliably and without you moving. You, you'll be able to move your body some, but really your head's gonna be fixed during this procedure. Okay, um, this is where it's interesting because we think about DBS as an ability to keep making changes downstream after the procedure. Well, during this procedure, some of that manipulation we get to do by heating the brain first before burning anything. Um, <clears throat> the heating process, again, we're gonna, the idea is to come in and out of the scanner, heat a little bit, test tremor, test for side effects. Um, and the main reason for this is because we can't really see the area that we want to burn or the area that we want to stimulate in DBS. It's an area that doesn't have landmarks. You can't see it on the MRI. You can see something that it's within, it's much bigger, but that's less useful. So we have to test in order to feel comfortable with where we're ultimately gonna burn a hole, in the case of DBS, where we're ultimately gonna put the wires. Um, all that's very important. Being awake, very important. Because um, we get a chance to shift the location of where this ultimately goes. Um, the MRI scans, are done you know, throughout this procedure multiple times. When you go back into the scanner, we can actually um, see the temperature rising in the MRI scanner, and then ultimately get a chance to see the, 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 uh, the area that we burn downstream. So how well does this work? This is sort of the sweet spot for everybody when we talk about this procedure. Um, it really works quite well. Um, the, this is some of the really early results, and I really want to harp on this because multiple other groups since have published on even better data, but this is what got the approval to begin with. Um, we do see that when you start off looking three months out, there is this very significant change, and you can kind of see that in the table here, the graph here, that the, there's a very significant change in the tremor scores that really do seem to persist, even though there is some return of tremor over time. Um, when you look at disability scores for folks, which actually is probably most important, not just how much are you shaking, but how much do you feel like there's an improvement? Um, there is this persistent improvement over time. One of the, uh, one of the changes here is that you see that some folks, um, when you're, when you're out about 12 months, you see that the sham, which is basically not having the procedure done. Um, you know, you're, you're having, uh, you're having um, some persistent benefit, especially after three months. This is really the key feature here. After three months, if there is tremor suppression, if there's quality improvement, you come back at a year, invariably, you're pretty much going to have that improvement. If not, you know, this procedure may not have been successful, uh, but we're, we feel very comfortable, which is why we tell folks you end up having to come back at least at three months after the procedure to follow up preferably as well at a year so that we can know the, from a longevity standpoint, how well did we do? Um, 
We also have increasing data that goes out several years, but here's just some regarding two years. You can see how, you know, here is where tremor starts in terms of severity. Here is where tremor improves to, lower scores are better, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in this case. And again, it's not a cure, right? So we're just making things better. And when you, and when you perform this, you see the stability that you can have at two years. You can see the stability in disability scores. Again, lower scores are better over two years. Um, this is an individual patient graph. This, this gets, if you kind of want to follow individual people over time, you can certainly do that as well. This gets to the whole point of how there is some variation in this. And so not everyone is a great candidate. There are folks who will be good candidates, some will be great candidates. Um, and sorting through that becomes really important as we uh, evaluate folks uh, for this procedure. What are the possible side effects? Um, so there's these are, again, early panels, and these are getting better as we perform the procedures, but it's important for folks to know about how these are possible side effects, because this has to do with structures around the area that we're trying to treat for tremor. Dizziness, coordination difficulties is perhaps always the most common, the one that we talk about the most, even during the procedure. During the procedure, we can see folks feel nauseated. We are heating the head, heating the brain, and headaches, perhaps not too surprisingly, come up as well, a feeling of flushness and warmth, and then some tingling. Past the, past the actual procedure though, downstream, again, sort of coordination difficulties, maybe some dizziness, balance issues come up as perhaps the, the most frequent that comes up early. Because once you burn that hole, one thing I, I for, forgive me, I neglected to mention, but it's related to this really, is there will be some swelling that occurs, right? You've just burnt a hole in the brain. There'll be some swelling and around that swelling, the swelling can cause side effects that should improve over time if it's only related to the swelling. Uh, the goal is to find out, is it only related to the swelling and will it improve over time? And certainly the hope is that, yes, it will improve over time. But some folks will experience speech difficulties, um, balance difficulties, some weakness, some sensation difficulties. But most of those these days are really improving. And it's because we're getting better and better with the procedure. These are, again, early results. But following them over time. Again, this is related. We believe that early numbers being higher is related to swelling and why at a year you have so much improvement of any of those potential side effects. But again, reasons to follow up with, uh, with the team over time. Um, perhaps this gets to the question that comes up frequently as well, which is why do we only burn one side at a time? So traditionally, when we go back to the 1940s and beyond, Folks wanted to have both sides treated and would often get that hot rod burning therapy um, on both sides. And when they would, the chances of side effects were certainly higher. Well, the technology has gotten much better and we have approval to perform this on both sides for focus ultrasound, which actually does not exist. That approval does not exist uh, for the traditional thalamotomy. But um, when we do this, we have already alluded previously to how we want to follow folks over a year to see if any side effects persist. And so the FDA has astutely told us we should be waiting nine to 12 months before performing this on the other side. So it is approved to do on both sides, but you can understand, I think now with that context, why we want to wait nine to 12 months. We want to see those side effects resolve because the last thing we want, especially when it comes to balance and coordination, is that anybody falls as a result of this procedure. Um, and if we, if we were to do this on both sides, we do fear that would, you know, immediately that is, we would fear that we would enhance that side effect. Um, okay, I already alluded to that. All right, so um, can your care team already help you before you even come and see us? Can it help, help you find out if you qualify? Well, some points, if you have a neurologist, I believe the answer is yes. A primary care doc may not be able to help you enough on this end, but um, as neurologists are learning more and more about this procedure, there's some things that they can certainly help us with to start, and you can help navigate the conversation. Some favorable signs that you could be a candidate for focus ultrasound, um, <clears throat> that your goal is really to treat the arm tremor and the arm tremor to be clear, right? If you have bad head tremor, this is not where we would recommend that you sort of push yourself into considering this therapy, um, leg tremor, et cetera. Um, if your goal is to treat both sides as quickly as you possibly can, it's gonna take you a year between procedures. So keep that in mind. Is that gonna be too frustrating? Um, we certainly would understand if it could or would be. So, you know, there might be other options for you. Um, and then, you know, favorable signs is that your diagnosis is essential tremor. And I didn't actually talk about this, but there is a second condition in the new criteria for essential tremor that's called essential tremor plus. 
I did allude to how you can have multiple tremor types. Essential tremor can come with other tremor types. And if you have other tremor types or other conditions, the belief is that your response may not be as good to focus ultrasound as it could be if you strictly had a central tremor, which gets to the concerning signs. So if you have any starting coordination difficulties along with your tremor, so just not directly related to tremor, but your balance is not great to start with coming into surgery. Um, you do have some speech difficulties, hard you know, difficulty coordinating uh, your speech for any particular reason. Um, and a hand that has less tremor is particularly hard to coordinate even though the tremor is mild. Uh, these are things that we would be concerned might be, those are symptoms we could enhance with the uh, focus ultrasound. So, so we, it would be a concerning sign in terms of potential candidacy. If your goal is to treat any tremor outside of the arms, um, that would be concerning. And again, the central tremor plus designation, which your neurologist, but at least, and if nothing else, at least your movement disorder specialist could help set, uh, delineate for you. All that is bringing us to meeting the team. So, um, you know, bringing focus ultrasound to UNC has been a longstanding goal. And with Dr. Krishna at the helm, it has been such a wonderful treat to get us going. Um, the team benefits we hope are that we, we are approaching this in, in a team-based way. Both of us are in the procedure, Dr. Krishna leading the effort to decide on targeting uh, myself on the testing end um, so that we could try to get a very comprehensive nature of uh, a meaningful test result, a meaningful uh, procedural result, one where we aim to maximize the tremor benefit, minimize the side effect profile from the uh, procedure. Um, and then the follow-up after surgery, we're hoping that there's a meaningful, we don't want to make it cumbersome for you, but we also do want to have sort of minimal standards. Uh, and we're hoping to sort of uh, pave the way for what those should be in this program. Uh, I want to make this uh, an opportunity to uh, plug one thing that we do at UNC that sort of uh, merges so well with this procedure, which is we have a first of its kind tremor interdisciplinary clinic. There isn't anything like this in the country except here. Um, we end up visiting with multiple providers to, in a full morning of appointments. The goal being really predominantly educational to talk about your tremor. You meet with me as a tremor specialist. Uh, you meet with Dr. Krishna as a functional neurosurgeon with tremor specialty. You meet with one of our occupational therapists uh, who is tremor subspecialized in her occupational therapy recommendations and opportunities. Um, and then there's so many additional team members uh, here for educational purposes, for biometric data analysis, meaning more objective data acquisition of tremor so that we understand it, uh, uh, and not just in terms of impact, but also in terms of measuring it effectively. Um, and then also uh, looking into whether you might qualify for research opportunities uh, in, this, uh, in this clinic. So with all this, I, like I mentioned, the, the main goal is to provide education and guidance for you even for your local providers who may not know that there's opportunities to treat your tremor differently um, as well. And that includes surgical and non-surgical options, right? But, um, you know, look, look in, uh, if, if this sounds interesting to you, we're always happy to have you. So in summary, um, it's a syndrome. A central tremor is a syndrome and it does require, as I think I've hopefully alluded to here is um, a keen eye, a good history to understand and distinguish it from other tremor syndromes. Um, the treatment for tremor that, uh, that is available should be tailored to your goals. So understanding what you want to improve, not just eliminating tremor becomes very important um, since a cure, unfortunately, is not yet available. Uh, focus ultrasound is now another tool and a great strategy on the surgical end to help treat tremor syndrome. So we're really excited to be able to offer it. Um, it does offer a minimally invasive option uh, for folks who are otherwise understandably hesitant uh, to pursue something a bit more invasive like deep brain stimulation surgery and something that certainly requires you to maintain hardware. Um, we talk about modulation and DBS, but we should also be talking about modulation and focus ultrasound. We get to heat the brain before burning that, that really small hole. Uh, the hope here is we keep being better about benefits and reducing side effects. Um, but at the end of this, I hope you, this so at least pushes you toward talking with your healthcare providers, neurologists or otherwise, because there are favorable and concerning signs that would make you or not make you a good candidate for this procedure. We're certainly happy to offer and answer those questions here, but, um, but we're starting to get a better sense of what those are. Uh, so you might be able to just uh, get some of those answers ahead of time. Uh, and here's just some information on how to 
ask for a referral in our clinics. Uh, like Dr. Krishna was saying, if uh, either of us could help uh, push you through the evaluation for focus ultrasound or even deep brain stimulation surgery, the Tremor Interdisciplinary Clinic uh, is housed in the neurology clinic, but Dr. Krishna, like I said, is a, an absolute pivotal member of that uh, group. So um, here's just a couple numbers where you could reach out and ask for that referral to uh, get scheduled into. And with that, do you want me to leave this slide up or do you? Want yes, please okay. leave that slide up for people to take down the information. Thank you so much, Dr. Roque. Thank you, Dr. Krishna. Um, we do have some questions in here and I know Dr. Krishna has been typing away, but I'm still going to voice them even though he typed answered them because other people on the webinar might have them. Um, so let me start with this. Dr. Roque, tremendous tremendously educational. Can you expand on what you mentioned at onset? Three-year arm tremor criteria is part of the diagnosis. Can you expand on that for him? Uh, sure. So um, this was in 2018 was the last time there's a group of folks internationally who get together about every five years, five to seven years to run through criteria for conditions. And this is not specific to movement disorders, uh, but it just so happens that this came up for tremor syndromes. Uh, in an international forum. And then the, the published results of this was just an understanding that we have growing information telling us that it, within the first three years, there is um, confusion sometimes regarding tremor, even by a movement disorder specialist. So sort of the highest trained individual as to whether the tremor they're seeing is a central tremor or a second syndrome um, or a mixed tremor for that matter. So um, the, they put in this criteria, the importance of two things, the three-year time mark just being so that we feel better about the diagnosis. It doesn't mean you don't have essential tremor within those first three years. It just makes us feel more confident about the diagnosis since we don't have anything more objective to use to diagnose the condition. Um, past that point as well is that, um, uh, uh, as I was mentioning, there's, there could be these mixed tremor syndromes of which you, sent, you can have a central tremor plus. So you, you really want to follow folks over time to make some meaningful sense of, of how there's an evolution, how there's an evolution of an individual's tremor. Uh, because you might think that there's tremor failure or treatment failure, excuse me, uh, for the tremor you see that you think is essential tremor in the first three years, but it's because it was a re-emergent tremor all along and you want to treat the rest tremor, which has a completely different set of medications to try. Uh, this was just the group's effort, the international consortium's effort uh, to put something meaningful on paper that we think will, will positively impact accurate diagnosis of this condition instead of making errors and mistakes. We want to minimize those in the community as much as we can. Perfect. Um, even though Dr. Krishna typed these answers, I'm still going to ask because there probably is other people on the webinar with it. How long does it take to get an appointment in, they said this clinic, but I'm pretty sure they're talking about that interdisciplinary clinic. And what is the path for insurance approval? This patient went on to say that they were recommended for focus ultrasound years ago when it was still new and only offered at um, a couple treatment centers across the country. And now it seems to be more widely available. Um, <clears throat> it's a lot of questions in there. So I'm going to try to separate them, make sure I get them all. Well, let's start with how long does it take to get an appointment with your interdisciplinary clinic, you guys? Yeah. Um, the, the short, with the interdisciplinary clinic in particular, um, you know, we, we were testing this, uh, internally for a good little while, just to make sure that we weren't uh, biting off more than we could chew, quite frankly. Because, uh, I mean, alone, thinking of the US, right, 10 million people, uh, we are one center, and we're seeing once a month, you know, four patients. So how, how do we how do we get through that carefully and thoughtfully for the moment? Um, the short answer is we've been able to get folks in within about three to four months. And that's even with opening up outside of this, of our system. So that's why we felt like it's time we could start advertising that, that we have this service and that we want to be able to offer it to others in the, in the uh, state. Um, so uh, if that starts to get way out there, our goal is to increase the frequency with which we have this clinic, not to, you know, not to have folks waiting two years to come in for this, because in that time frame, you would have seen somebody else. So we, we really want to keep it to within four months as best as we can. Uh, and that's certainly what we would, not just our aim, but that's currently the case. So, um, yeah. 
Yes. So I'm going to do a follow-up question that kind of merges. So is that the only pathway to see you guys for focus ultrasound? Is this interdisciplinary clinic? Or if you don't want all the interdisciplinary people, can you start with just a consult with Dr. Krishna or Dr. Roque with you and then maybe evaluate if that's the path to go or is it all or great, one it's or a great question. It's a great question. Since the goal, like I mentioned, the interdisciplinary clinic's goal is to educate and to sort of provide guidance. That's a whole separate pathway from the pathway to, I want to be specifically evaluated for surgical considerations, right? Um, in that pathway, Dr. Krishna and I have a shared model, which I think is what's afforded us the ability to be more readily available. So usually we can get folks in within about six weeks for the first appointment, just to make some, some um, uh, sort of thoughts and headway into what we, you know, do we think that you'd be a good candidate? Um, and then that gets the process going that Dr. Krishna mentioned that within those couple of months, we're already seeing that you know, we can we can get you into into a procedure. OK, this next question. Um, so the patient started uh, with head shaking. It has progressed into while they sing. So a voice tremor, but now also shaking while they eat. Is there available option when you have that different types of tremor? So. Um, it's a little bit loaded without knowing more, but the, but I'll, I'll, I'll maybe answer the point of the question, which is often when this kind of story comes about, it's because there is head tremor and the head tremor is really what we want to treat. Um, the head tremor is not an infrequently, com an infrequent complaint. It certainly comes up a lot. And sometimes it is the predominant feature uh, of somebody's tremor syndrome. When that happens right now, we don't have a specific FDA approved um, form of, use, of using an advanced therapeutic technique to reduce the tremor. It doesn't mean we haven't tried. Um, so this is something that we're always happy to entertain during one of those uh, clinic visits to kind of walk through. But uh, uh, we've had some successes, but it's very, very specifically tailored. So it's hard to make a generalization. Um, part of it, again, goes back to do we have the right you know, diagnosis at the end of the day, right? Is the, is the head shaking because of an underlying tremor syndrome or is it because of a dystonia? Getting that answer right helps drive subsequent decision-making. Beautifully said, I love that answer. So this um, person, but we get this question a lot, so I'm gonna make it a little bit broader. What if um, a patient has um, a total knee done or a stimulator or a pacemaker um, would that disqualify them from getting focus ultrasound or seeking this intervention? Oh, that's a good Dr. Krishna question. Dr. Krishna, do you want to take that one? Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Okay. And so certainly there's, there are some implants that can impact your candidacy for focus ultrasound treatment. And so it's a, a little bit of a nuance. We have to look into the detail. For most of the joint replacements, they don't affect your candidacy for focused ultrasound. So you can still get focused ultrasound if you had hip replacement or knee replacement, uh, no problems there. If you are on blood thinners, you know, and need to come off of, of blood thinners for treatment, that's not certainly not a disqualifying feature either. For certain stimulators, uh, like spinal cord stimulator, you have to look into the manufacturer guidelines, but that can sometimes impact your candidacy for focused ultrasound. Uh, as far as uh, the the pacemakers go, also you know there are some nuances to it to, to look into whether that could impact your candidacy. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, another question we get is how do you manage? It's not in here, but some patients are very claustrophobic. Um, do you guys offer any help for those people? I.e maybe uh, a walkthrough so that they understand how far they're going to be in the MRI or any kind of anxiety medication or sedation for patients that have a claustrophobic problem? How do you both handle that? Certainly, that's, that's a great question, uh, Katie. And, and again, this, this comes up. And, and so not all claustrophobia is the same. You know, some claustrophobia is, is, is different from the others. And certainly a walkthrough, having a... Uh, sort of a vision of what, what it takes and how you are in the MRI machine. In some sense, that's why the preoperative MRI that we obtained is, is within the same building, same MRI. So that gives you access 
to that environment and for you to really assess how it feels like to be into the into the MRI area and for you to assess how things would go. And and all the treatment team members, you know, we are we are there, it's all hands on the deck and then we try to support you and get you through the procedure. And some for some patient patients it's it's reassuring that you come in and out of the MRI environment as Dr. O'K said for, for testing. And so that helps as well. So it's not that that you're in the MRI environment for the entire hour duration of the treatment. So we, we bring you in and out of the of the uh, MRI magnet to do testing. Uh, and certainly in uh, scenarios where if the patient feels it will be beneficial to have some anti-anxiety medicine beforehand, yeah, we are open to doing that as well. Awesome. I think we've done a wonderful job. There's no open questions for our attendees. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Strongly encourage you. If you think of questions after that, please contact them. They're more than willing to answer and talk with you. Um, and for Dr. Roque, Dr. Krishna, uh, your time is invaluable. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day, um, educating us and showing us just the value of your focus ultrasound program there in North Carolina. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.